My name is Marisa Perdomo, and I am excited uh, to be part of this uh, Integrative Health and Wellness Symposium. Before we start, I'd like to share a personal story of how I came to value and respect yoga and meditation as a healing modality. Um, I was diagnosed with cancer three times, once as a teenager, and then a recurrence in my 20s, and then a totally different cancer in my 30s. And as a result of all of the radiation and chemo and surgeries that I've had, uh, I ended up with significant musculoskeletal uh, dysfunction and pain. And I probably spent about 25 years being in some level of physical pain every day. And I'm very grateful to all the physical therapist and the exercise physiologist and the personal fitness trainers and the physicians who not only help me uh, recover from these treatments, but have kept me functioning, kept me employable and giving me some quality of life. However, in January of 2013, I started practicing yoga and I uh, ended up with Kundalini yoga because uh, other yogas that I attempted all caused more pain. But when I took my first Kundalini yoga class, I actually felt better. So as a result, I enrolled in uh, teacher training programs and have become a certified level two Kundalini yoga instructor. And one of the things you're hearing me talk about in, throughout this presentation about yoga and meditation is that there's the personal experience and what how your body feels and then there there are the actual physical changes in your body that occurs as a result of a regular yoga and meditation practice and I used to joke with my physicians that um, I would say you know I said I know this sounds crazy but I feel like I'm getting younger I feel like my uh, my body is changing. I feel like my genes have changed. And they just used to smile and kind of laugh. And I said, no, no, I, I really do. I feel so different. And to be a physical therapist, to be a person who looks to science to give us a rationale and, a, and, and support um, evid evidence to implement our interventions, I was quite, um, sur not surprised, but I was very happy when I realized that we have ab absolutely have scientific evidence of the physiological responses, positive physiological responses that a regular yoga and meditation uh, practice can give the practitioner. And I was even more surprised um, because there is some research that's pointing to changes in gene expression in gene activity for the positive. Um, and I will tell you one story due to my medical history, it was recommended that I get genetic testing because it was felt like I had such a high probability of having um, mutated one of the mutated genes that cause cancer. So when I go into the see the physicians and the geneticists for the results of my test, uh, I remember uh, them saying that they were astounded at my results because they tested approximately four, for 40 different genes that could cause cancer. And they fully expected me to, uh, my test results to come back positive for genetic change. And instead, what the physician says, we are totally astonished that you do not have one genetic mutation in these genes that could cause cancer. And I remember my response was, you see, my genes have changed as a result of yoga and meditation. So that's my little joke that I say to myself, um, that I have the, the experience of what my body felt and who knows, if it has any science will tell us if that's a true statement or not. But from my heart, I like to believe that it is. All right, so we're gonna move on and get 
to the more serious aspects of our presentation. So my goal is basically just to prevent broadly the research evidence that really does outline for each of us the overall health benefits that practicing yoga and, me and meditation can uh, potentially provide us as we strive to move toward health and wellness. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the sound modalities or the sound therapy that's often used to promote well-being and, and healing, and I'll present the evidence for that. And I hope everybody walks away with really understanding these positive physio physiological responses to meditation, sound healing, and yoga, and how it really does contribute to our overall health and well-being. And then on a personal level, I hope that maybe this yoga module, if you've attended the other yoga sessions, that this encourages you or excites you to go out and experience a yoga class. There's many different types and there's many different types of meditation. And I just really want everyone to find something that feels good to them and gives them a positive experience and that you can incorporate that into your daily life to help promote wellness and healing. <coughs> so first of all, yoga and meditation is a mind-body practice and it originated in ancient Indian philosophy. And originally it was designed to deepen the practitioner's understanding of the sacredness of life and the mystical forces of life. The word yoga actually means to yoke or to join. And so one of the tenets of yoga is that uh, with yoga and meditation, it's allowing the practitioner to link their individual consciousness with universal consciousness. Or you could, some people prefer to say the God within with the universal God consciousness. And it, yoga combines, you know, physical postures called asanas, breathing techniques or pranayam uh, with uh, meditation and relaxation to bring about an experience of well being. So in the broader category, yoga, meditation, sound, healing, fall, all falls under the category of mind-body therapies. And simplistically stated, it's uh, defined as a group of therapies that emphasize the use of the brain in conjunction with the body to assist the healing process. Now, when we talk about meditation, there's many different types of meditation, but this is a similar thread through all of the meditation. You could consider it a mental exercise that trains the, trains the practitioner to train their attention and their awareness. It can improve an individual's focus, ability to focus. Or you could define it as a conscious technique to achieve a mentally clear and emotionally calm state to understand our own actions. And one could say then that the purpose of meditation is really to help the practitioner gain control over their own physiological and emotional responses to stress, whether that stress is from the environment, from another person, from noise, wherever. Um, and then from our own inner mind, that own inner negative dialogue that we give ourselves. And hopefully when you gain control over those responses, that's what aids in developing or producing a deep state of relaxation. And then we calm the mind. So again, in general, the overall benefits of meditation, some of the emotional benefits is it, meditation can be a tool to help the practitioner build skills so that we can manage those stress stressors in our life. It builds us, increases our ability to focus on the present so that our mind doesn't wander. Um, it's offering said, you know, that a, a, a wandering mind um, can 
increase this stress response. And if we can focus our thoughts, then we can decrease some of the stressors in our life. Um, meditation can, again, help reduce some of those negative emotions. And it has been shown to increase creativity, patience, and tolerance. And although meditation, we're not saying that meditation and yoga can cure any pathology, any disease, many of the pathologies or diseases or illnesses that affect our society today have a stress component. And it is that ability for meditation and yoga to reduce the physiological response to stress. Therefore, it could have a positive effect with people with asthma, suffer from depression or anxiety, um, have a sleep dysfunction, tension headaches, chronic pain, or even just the, the emotional stresses when you're diagnosed with cancer and going through all the treatments. So research supports that yoga and meditation can in influence the inflammatory responses, the inflammatory processes of our body. Research supports that it can have an effect on gene expression, on our endocrine or our hormone and our immune system responses to stress, and that yoga and meditation, it can be an effective tool in helping to reduce physical symptoms, improve physical function, improve emotional well-being and quality of life. And in the broader picture, it helps to create a sense of calmness, of peace and balance. So when we're talking about the physiological mechanisms for health, uh, for of yoga and meditation for health, first of all, we think of the nervous system. So we have an autonomic nervous system and we have that sympathetic nervous system, which is that fight or flight response. And you're going to get it create it. We also have a hormonal response. We're going to have increased cortisol, cortisol levels. We're going to have an, an immune system response and our immune system stress um, can create what we call these pro inflammatory cells or cytokines in response to stress. So the benefits of yoga and meditation that research does show that it decreases that sympathetic nervous system tone. It gets us out of that fight or flight response and gets into what we call like, it's called parasympathetic nervous system or general housekeeping. You know, you don't want to be at that heightened awareness 24 hours a day. It's not good for our body because it activates these pro-inflammatory cells. Um, so when we do yoga and meditation, um, we, our physiological responses, it lowers those pro-inflammatory cells. At the same time, it can enhance or increase the production of the anti-inflammatory cells. And we all know stress and its relation to disease. So that's a good thing. Research also is showing us that in expert uh, practitioners that yoga and meditation I mean, I mean, expert practitioners in yoga and meditation, that even when they are in a stressful situation, their body physiologically produces less of those pro-inflammatory cells than uh, novice practitioners. And then you, when we're looking at it from a, uh, a population perspective, you know, we're always talking about risk factors. How can we reduce risk factors to decrease our risk for cardiovascular disease or diabetes or in cancer, as an example? Well, it research has shown that regular yoga practitioners who have risk such who have risk factors such as obesity, depression, cardiovascular disease, um, if they practice yoga on a regular basis they have the potential to reduce um, their uh, pro-inflammatory markers as compared to uh, the predictive values for other others with those same risk factors. So I feel like this is pretty, giving us some pretty good evidence of those physiological benefits to practice yoga and meditation. 
So specifically, what does the research say? Well, we know that yoga and meditation lowers our heart rate, our blood pressure, the respiratory rate, getting us out of that sympathetic nervous system tone and getting us into parasympathetic. We Research has shown that um, meditation can um, regulate or influence gene activity. So meaning it can stimulate genes that are responsible for producing an increased immune system function, which is great. And it can also, what we say, down-regulate the genes or dampen the activity of the genes that produce those, that are triggered to produce the inflammatory response. There is some research that also says that regular meditation can trigger uh, or, or improve the neurotransmitter levels in our brain, such as the gamma, which is a common neurotransmitter. And the gamma levels are responsible for that improved mood and helps to decrease anxiety. Another example is that functional MRI studies, we actually have imaging of the brain in meditators and it can produce structural changes or what we call neuroplasticity of the brain. And an example of that is it shows that meditation can increase blood flow. And that's an important, better blood flow for cognitive function. So we could think about maybe there's a potential uh, benefit for people who are suffering from uh, memory loss as an example. So moving on, we uh, wanna talk about sound as a healing tool. So sound as a healing tool has been used for thousands and thousands of years, and it has its roots in many cultures. Example, the Australian Aboriginal tribes use the didgeridoo. Tibetan monks use the quartz bowls or the singing bowls and bells. Native American tribes use drumming and chanting. And then there's the mantra meditation used in some Indian yogic practices. But what I want to emphasize here, it's not just, um, it, we're going to be talking about the science, but it's also an experience, yoga and meditation, that's what's so difficult to, to quantify it because everyone who does a practice experiences something in their body. And specifically for sound, it's not just hearing the sound, but when we talk about sound, there is those physical vibrations or frequencies that our bodies can feel. And so we're trying, research is trying to quantify that. Um, so, or in other words, trying to find here's an intervention and here's the physiological effect so that we can use it potentially as a, as a intervention tool for healing, just like we use uh, prescription drugs or just like we use um, an exercise program. So back to sound, to some of the background or basic principles of sound, when researchers are studying it, it they they're typically call it vibroacoustics, because we know that every musical tone vibrates at a, at a different frequency or a different speed. And the higher the pitch of that tone, the higher the frequency, the lower the pitch, the lower the frequency. Uh, vibrations are measured in hertz. And um, we're, uh, the frequency then is defined as the number of cycles per second that a sound wave vibrates. And just to put it into context, humans can hear frequencies um, between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. So research is now looking at what are there physical, physiological differences in the brain or in the body, in our organs, in our cells, between low frequencies and high frequencies? So, I mean, I, I just find this, the research is pretty fascinating. Um, and I just wanted to bring this up because for example, low frequencies, our human body feels them stronger. And it is believed that it can lead to greater experiences of relaxation and pain relief. So vibration frequencies, it has been proposed in, in uh, one, in a, in a few research studies that approximately 30 to 120 Hertz are therapeutic. And other researchers are trying to define, okay, which frequency would be best or tested to see if it can give pain relief. And so one research researcher came up with this range of 60 to 600 Hertz could be used 
as a pain relief modality. So just think about the potential for that using sound instead of taking a narcotic and especially in the opioid epidemic that we're experiencing today. This has the potential to really be a, a powerful tool. And I wanna give another example. <clears throat> One researcher um, from NIH, Patrick, I can't remember his, uh, the year. Um, but anyway, he studied a, a group of cancer patients and just did one 40 minute session of sound therapy or what they would call vibroacoustic session in uh, cancer patients receiving chemotherapy. And they did a measurement pre-test and post-test and uh, some questionnaires. And the range was 61 to 74% of the 41 patients reported either a reduction of pain or a reduction of their other symptoms or both. And again, that was just one 40 minute session of sound or vibroacoustic session. So since we're on sound, I just wanna point out that researchers have shown that music also produces very similar effects in, uh, as meditation and yoga. So music also helps to reduce stress and anxiety and it has been shown that it music, self-selected music reduces the needs for medications or drugs such as pain relievers and sedatives. And then the physiological responses are very similar as you can see to meditation. <clears throat> and I wanted to point out um, from this study, uh, looking at a Tibetan um, singing bowl uh, meditation, playing, playing the bowls during a meditation. Again, very similar to what music and yoga and meditation, decreasing anxiety, tension, fatigue, and depression. But what I found very interesting that the, the proposed mechanism of action, why it works, and it has to do with that the, um, the oscillation of the tone, so that the, the hearing and oscillation between two different frequencies somehow is a method to stimulate the brain into synchronizing its wavelength and um, and, and entering it into um, a specific. Uh, brainwave pattern, whether it's alpha, delta, or theta. So different sounds can create the brain to synchronize itself, all of the brain to go, let's say, <clears throat> uh, into an alpha, alpha wave pattern. And so they looked at some people during meditation and they were able, their brain waves went into a very specific alpha pattern. Um, they looked at uh, um, sound and noticed that um, in some individuals, certain frequencies or certain uh, hertzes could trigger the brain to synchronize itself into a delta wave pattern during sleep. But that's different than the wave, the brain wave pattern that was achieved during a relaxation or a meditation. And um, certain sounds, frequency, vibrations could stimulate the brain to synchronize itself into theta waves. And theta waves indicated a deep relaxation that was most commonly uh, demonstrated in experienced uh, practitioners in meditation. And then they were also relating to different parts of the brain that were stimulated. So I just feel like this is a this is on the cusp. You know, this is early um, 
in its research, but it at least gives us an understanding of why we can feel re getting into these different states of relaxation versus sleep uh, versus meditation, because it's actually synchronizing the brave wave patterns to either alpha, delta, or theta. So what is Kundalini me mantra meditation? So first of all, Kundalini is typically called the, um, uh, the, the practice of awareness, the spiritual energy of awareness. And it is activated through uh, yoga, meditation, including breathing um, and the physical posturing um, to create harmony between the mind, body, and spirit. And kundalini yoga has to have all those components. It has to have the, the focus on breathing, the physical posturing, the meditation, and the relaxation in order to be called the kundalini yoga set. Um, and just, I have provided on this slide uh, a website that actually has organized all the research that has been examining kundalini yoga uh, research and its effect on health. And um, rather than if you're having trouble finding it through uh, the library. So the specific kundalini yoga med meditation that's been used is what we call curtain kriya. And I'm going to show you the picture because I think it's easier to understand. But in general, this curtain kriya uses hand movements. So you can see the picture. And you're going to be reciting sa, ta, na, ma. And you're going to be moving your fingers to each one of those syllables. While at the same time, you're visualizing um, light coming through the crown of the head and then exiting through the brow point or between the eyebrows. So you're gonna be stimulating a lot of different portions of the brain, the motor cortex, you're gonna be, when you're reciting sa, ta, na, ma, um, you're actually stimulating, the tongue is moving and it's stimulating different points on the palate. So there's a lot of areas of the brain um, that get stimulated. Now, so just briefly, we'll talk about a little bit of um, the research, but um, remember we talked about how meditation could possibly have an effect on genes or gene expressions. Well, in this study on uh, family dementia caregivers, and I have to mention that this is a randomized control style trial, which is a very high level of evidence. So it gives us much, uh, it, it's, much more powerful uh, results and for us to translate it into some sort of healthcare practice. So it was that Sata Nama or that Kirtan Kriya was performed in one group versus the other group uh, listening to some relaxing music for 12 minutes daily for eight weeks. And what was very uh, interesting is, is that the Kirtan Kriya or the Kundalini Yoga Meditation group discovered um, 68 genes that their gene expression was changed. So remember we talked about maybe you want some genes to increase production of let's say healthy immune system function and you might want to down regulate or dampen the genes that produce let's say for an example um, uh, different white blood cells or any of those pro-inflammatory cells. So that's what I really just want you to take away from here is that this kundalini yoga meditation had a, demonstrated an effect on gene activity. I think that's very powerful. I'm going to talk about another study that talks about uh, telomeres. And telomeres are basically... Um, there are protective um, proteins on the ends of chromosomes. And in this picture, they're those little like red caps on the ends. And telomeres uh, shorten with cell division. And they basically, um, the length of those telomeres shortens or decreases as we age. And the rate at which these uh, telomeres shorten may indicate the, the rate at which your body is aging. 
Now, we also know that um, there are many lifestyle factors which can increase the pace of aging in an individual. And we all know this smoking, lack of physical activity, obesity, stress, exposure to pollution. Um, so these can increase the speed or the rate at which the tolomere uh, shortens, therefore increasing your physiological age, if I could say it that way. Um, and we also know that um, some from some research that eating an appropriate diet, getting regular exercise um, may or has the potential, again, to now reduce the speed or the rate at which that tolomere gets shortened. So again, it's that the, the speed at which our body is aging, maybe, if I can be so bold. So there was a study by Le, I'm going to butcher her name. I apologize. Lavretsky in two, from UCLA in 2013. And again, they're looking at the, the Kirtan Kriya meditation in family dementia caregivers. Um, and this time they're specifically, I want to focus on the Tellermace activity. Uh, so this was again, 12 minutes a day, daily for eight weeks. They either did the Kirtan Kriya or they'd listen to relaxation music. And what I really just want to point out is that there is an enzyme that's responsible for the activity in the tolomeres. And God, honey. The is that the Kirtan Kriya group showed a 43% improved enzyme activity, that tolomere ACE activity that's responsible for perhaps uh, slowing the rate of decline of that tolomere at the end of the chromosome versus the music group only showed a 3.7% improvement. And so that leads us to, or the research suggests that this Kirtan Kriya potentially improves the stress-induced cellular aging. And we know that as we age, we are more susceptible to diseases. So obviously larger uh, randomized controlled trials are needed. But I found this uh, really uh, fascinating. And um, if, if there's something as simple as a meditation that can maybe slow down the cellular aging process, could that, the question is, could that potentially aid in improving our health? <clears throat> we'll see. So this is um, what I believe that some of this research hopefully will potentially be able to move meditation and yoga from outside of mainstream medicine and potentially into becoming a standard intervention option that could be offered to everyone. Um, but as I said, we, we definitely... So... Yoga and meditation, um, I, this is not my slide, uh, um, Dr. Satbir Khalsa, who is a, a researcher in Massachusetts and is affiliated with uh, Harvard University and, we're, and uh, primarily um, Brigham Hospital. Uh, that I uh, modified this and took this from one of his presentations. But again, just summarizing that the components of yoga and meditation, you know, practicing the yoga, the physical aspect of the yoga can provide improvement in flexibility, balance, strength, coordination. And you combine that with the breathing techniques, which can help control these emotional responses to stress, these physiological responses, combined with a regular practice of meditation, which again allows us to focus our attention to gain control of that wandering mind in order to contribute to the decrease 
to the control of our physiological stress responses all work together to create um, uh, health and positive well-being. So again, it's that relationship between stress, emotional and physical, and the ability to self-regulate that stress and then the ability to increase the awareness of our own emotions and gaining control over that wandering mind. So in summary, I'd just like to end with that the science of yoga and meditation as a healing modality is very encouraging and we're having more RCTs, higher level of evidence to give us more support in using this in our daily lives as a healing modality. Um, and um, the evidence is showing that there that the physiological responses to sound and music is can be very similar to uh, meditation. However, there are some specific differences, especially with that Kirtan Kriya mantra meditation. And then, uh, obviously, I hope that some of this propels you to experience different types of yoga, different types of meditation, maybe exploring different sound uh, modalities, whether it's Tibetan bowls, crystal bowls, a gong, singing, chanting, anything that resonates in a positive way for you. And then to explore, go uh, and explore your own physiological responses, your emotional responses to this music and see how it can aid you in improving your overall health and wellness. I'd like to end with um, this quote from Prem Rawit, be in awe of this existence, be in awe of this breath, be in awe of this life instead of the long list of everything that is wrong with your life. Thank you very much. Um, the next uh, module in the yoga platform will be our roundtable discussion, live discussion and questions from our panel. And here is our panel and I hope you stick around and join us for our next discussion. Thank you. Uh, here's our panel. I'm just going to have everybody briefly introduce themselves. My name is Marisa Perdomo. I'm a physical therapist here at USC uh, and have been a member of the Institute for Integrative Health and Wellness since its inception and uh, I'll hand it over to Jim. Jim Burklow, Senior Associate Dean, Religious and Spiritual Life at USC, and I've been on the uh, IHW Steering Committee for 12 years now, and it's just, it's awesome to be together today. Thank you, Marisa, for beautiful. Sarah? Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Ivanhoe, uh, Director of Yoga USC, and this is my first time, so, I'm, uh, you guys have been around from the beginning and I'm the new, the new one on the block. Thanks so much for having me, really an honor to be here. Uh, May? Hi everybody, my name is May Chi and I'm a yoga therapist. I've been practicing for some time now and um, got quite a bit of training from India as well as in the States. So my passion is combining everything together all these different philosophies. And if you attended my session, you'll know, teach more philosophically and conceptually. So very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and Gabrielle. Hello, everybody. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Gabrielle Lewis. I'm originally from England, from Manchester. Been living in Los Angeles for 13 and a half years. And I found yoga and meditation because I was disconnected from myself and it's completely transformed my life. And I combine psychology with yoga and meditation. So I focus a lot on mental health and I also specialize in Kundalini yoga, which is what uh, Marisa led us through just before. So it's such a pleasure and happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Mm. 
So I'm excited to have this panel of experts and uh, practitioners here. You, we have a wide breadth and depth of experience. So I guess, Emily, um, our moderator, a huge thank you to you for being here and keeping us sane and calm as we navigate technology. And I don't know if there's any questions in the chat, but if there are, take, go, go for it. So participants should be able to see an option for Q&A and you guys can go ahead and if you have any questions for any of our wonderful panelists, um, just go ahead and type it in the Q&A and we'll get going. If there if there's no immediate question, maybe uh, Sarah or Jim, I can put you on the spot and talk about all the yoga programs that you guys have and meditation that you've been offering and developing here at SC. That, Sarah? Uh, <laughs> Please, Sarah. Oh, you're uh, muted. There you go. Unmute myself. Yeah, great. Thanks so much. Um, well, I've just been at SC for about a year and a half now and really starting to see how much yoga and meditation is just pervasive so much already on campus. Uh, we started mostly since COVID, uh, just, just trying to harness and promote everybody's Zoom activities that are already happening and uh, you know do kind of adapt to this new world like everybody else is. So um, we just kind of completed our semester's worth of um, offerings through Yoga USC and, and plan for next year. Thank you. And Jim, I, maybe you want to give a shout out about your mindfulness meditation program that you've been leading so wonderfully. Well, yeah, we, uh, our office uh, uh, started mindful.usc.edu, which is uh, now uh, serves thousands of students and staff every year with five week, uh, one hour and a half a week classes in basic mindfulness practice, uh, secular uh, modality of it. Uh, so that's been a huge program that just exploded. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just one of the teachers at this point. We have a, a staff for it and it's become a very robust, a very robust program. Apropos of that, do you mind me asking a question? Go for it, Jim. It's the time. Um, and that is, you know, we, there's a ton of, you know, there's all sorts of science about um, mindfulness, right? And I think it's probably uh, easier in a way to do science on that because it's, a, you know, the way it's the secular practice of it is a pretty discrete thing, right? Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's definable. Uh, the, mo the, the mode of it is uh, pretty straightforward and simple. Um, and I, I'm just, and I don't know, and you know, I know there's, I've read, you know, I'm not, I'm not a researcher. I'm not an expert on, on the science here, but um it just seems to me yoga is a lot more complicated in terms of the modalities of it. Uh, and then, but, I, but I'm just wondering, um, with your experience, all of you as practitioners, how do you, how do you think uh, yoga, physical yoga practice relates, enhances, or connects with uh, what we think of as secular mindfulness practice? In other words, does it enhance? Is it distinct, um, et cetera? Um, where do you think the two, how do the two meet? How do they meet? That's my question. Um, I'll start off and then Sarah and May and Gabrielle can add. I think first of all, it's focusing. that When, when you're doing the yoga, just the poses, you are focusing on how to do the poses. So that's one part, one aspect, you know, all meditation, no matter what form it is, requires attention and focus. Um, I think the second component is, is that we add the breathing. So you're focusing on your breathing again, focus, but now you're moving into that pair, perhaps moving into more of a parasympathetic nervous system control. And then I think you're, 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 you're going inward. In other words, to stay focused on the yoga, you're not paying attention to what's going around you. You're not looking at the other people in the yoga class. So that mind is not that monkey mind or that wandering mind. You're actually bringing all your attention internally 
to your breath, your breathing, the actual exercise. And I always kind of say, it's like you get lost in yourself. That, that, that's how I describe it. I don't know how our other yoga practitioners, anybody want to add, would be great. Yeah, I'm happy to share. Um, Marissa, I think you were completely spot on. And for me, the key term, and it's, I guess it's just kind of languaging, um, is consciousness mm -hmm. and awareness and mindfulness is incorporates all of that. So when we're going about anything and yoga, the way I look at yoga is it's a state of being and you um, expressed before with the physical practice. So with yoga, we've got many different subtle layers to the practice. Um, but and for me, one of them is that consciousness. So exactly like Marissa was saying, you're focusing your mind on something, whether it be a posture, movement, breath, mantra, and then you're directing that energy so you can um, heighten your awareness to yourself and your body and that mind-body connection. Um, and then also, because there's so many different kinds of yoga, um, speaking from the Kundalini perspective, um, we hold postures for varying lengths of time with Kundalini yoga. So that has a, um, a physical response to it, but then you're also developing that mental grit by holding it for an, an extended period of time. So through that, again, you're having to focus on so many different aspects of things that you're able to increase that awareness, that consciousness, that mindfulness. And Sarah, we did get a question um, that if we could somehow list um, the yoga classes or uh, at SC. So I'm assuming we can put that on the web, the web, the Institute for Integrative Health and Wetness website. Is that where we can put it? Sure. Uh, the easiest is for you guys can go to yoga .u, uh, yoga .usc .edu. Um but I can also share all that information that can we can collaborate on that. I did just want to chime in to, um, to Jim's question. I think it's such a, a poignant question. Um, I, I've done quite quite a bit of meditation, and for me, uh, my, my my seated meditation practice feels more about, as we sort of said, awareness and consciousness. Whereas my physical yoga practice, uh, I feel like one of the kind of distinctions throughout history is that the physical yogis were aesthetics. They really, uh, the practitioner, instead of simply being aware of the energy, the practitioner gets in there and really tries to take action and balance it out. So all of these yoga practices that we have, these, um, you know, the different, the, the kriyas or the asanas or the pranayama practices we do are with intention to kind of co-create and not just um, kind of sit uh, in, in uh, aware, like witness consciousness of an experience, but to get in and, you know, if, if I'm, uh, you know, I do a lot of teaching on sleep. So if I'm, you know, one of the things for in a yoga practice we would teach for sleep is we would do what we would call a chandra bedana or a moon channel breathing. Um, because we would sort of say, oh, you're, you know, the energy channels are kind of out of whack, out of balance. And you've got too much sun energy and we we'll want to learn how to quiet you down. Uh, stuff like this. So that the, the yoga practitioner really does take an active part in steering that energy. Now, how we measure that scientifically, that it's, it's, a very, <laughs> it's a very different question. Yeah. But to me, that's sort of a, a distinction. Yes, yeah, Sarah, that's a fabulous statement because um, in some of my, in my learning more obviously about meditation and, and yoga, the, the, the synchronization of the brainwave patterns or the, how the brain entrains uh, sound and it, and it does basically get us into a different brave brainwave pattern, which parallels what you were just talking about in people who have difficulty sleeping and through science, they have uh, supported and, and found a certain wavelength that creates a certain brave brainwave pattern that causes better sleep. 
So maybe yogis and practitioners have known and had a different explanation for it, um, different terminology, but science is finally starting to catch up to what yoga practitioners have known for years or meditators have known for years. So I think that's a beautiful example of how um, science is supporting uh, the practice. Uh, I'm reading one question here and I wanna see if anybody from the panel wants to chime in from the audience. It states, in my personal experience as a millennial, I sense a different language around mental health and meditation between generations. As a panel of experts from different backgrounds, how do you think we can bridge the generational gap, specifically in terms of discussing the mind and mental health more as a part of daily life in yoga and meditation and outside of that as well? So I just have to let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> it's a great question. Go for it. Well, I, I feel like the next generation is paving the way for that. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like the, the, the way that all this is being talked about in social media and with each other, there's a real destigmatization mm -hmm. that I hope our generation will learn <laughs> from this. Uh, I, I, feel, I, I feel like the next generation is really leading it and it's very exciting. maybe mention a couple things. Um, so, you know, in working with teenagers um, with um, in, treat, in residential treatment, um, and I know they're not necessarily millennials, but just future generations, you know, one of the things that I was really surprised to, to, to learn, because I was used to teaching more adults previous to that, was they were much more receptive to meditation than I had ever expected. And they were very receptive to um, breathing techniques, and um, not only were they receptive, they were very um, they they could they could feel the immediate um, effects of it. Whereas you know previous to that, and it, of course it depends on which population you're teaching to, but it, especially in the more conventional uh, modern yoga world where you're you know doing it in studios, um, the tendency I found was people didn't enjoy the meditation. They were, they didn't get it. It was very frustrating. And so it was very interesting to see that the next generation actually, you know, again, depending on the population you were with was actually much more receptive. And it was, it was very um, encouraging to see that. And I mean, to the point where I really want to create more programs for, for children and for teens. Um, so it's, it'll be very interesting to see what happens in the coming generations. I'm very hopeful. I'm the same as May. I love working, um, with teens and, and that generation. Um, I, this is my wheelhouse, I, I love this. And I think for me, it all boils down to education. And um, like I think Sarah said, taking that destigmatization out of it, but it, we have to start understanding how our minds work, how our breathing works. You know, I remember, it took me, I think, a year of doing yoga and then a year of teacher training for me to understand the principle of long, deep breathing. So we're not taught these concepts from an educational standpoint as to, oh, this is how we can apply this technique when you're feeling depressed or if you're having a panic attack, this is something that we can do. So I think if we keep al along with the education, then we can keep bridging the gap. Um, and then thinking about it the other way, because I remember I always, when I first started my practice, I always used to get frustrated with my older generations in the family that they just wouldn't get it. Um, and so I think a lot of bridging the gap is about being the change, right? I love be the change we wish to see in the world, Gandhi. But it's about leading from example. So by you um paving the way if that's something that is um of interest to you you be the example you shine the light you be the pied piper to um illuminate and start bridging the gap in this way so that none I, I would you. chime in there I, 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 amen on what sarah said about this new generation uh 
has destigmatized de mental illness or uh, you know uh, emotional issues and all that. The, the stigmas faded so much from my generation, which is great. <laughs> I just love to hear what the rest of you have to say about this. Though, is that another thing that's destigmatized is stress, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's you know a lot of our kids at USC students uh, they just think it's normal to be in a state of, of stress all the time that that's just the deal you know mm -hmm. that's what comes with being a high performing student and uh, ambitious person and elite university student so you know the uh, uh, seeking mental health treatment is destigmatized but so is the uh, mental health problem um, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, I think, you know, there's an openness to uh, everything we're talking about here today at IHW's yeah. event. Nothing and I, I would just like to give an example of how to bridge the gap uh, and bringing mind and mental health into daily life. Um, and I, the classic example that comes to me is, I mean, I grew up in a, in a Latin Catholic family. And so my you know, grandparents and my parents' generation saying the rosary was uh, a very routine. And, um, and when you recite the rosary and you, you get, it's basically a meditation. But I think when you're explaining something to a different, an older generation that might not understand the terminology, if you can ha use examples like that, um, because every religion, every spiritual practice has, uh, whether it's a, 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 a mal, uh, what are those malas, the beads or the rosary, they have something. And I, and I think if we can give them the, the example from their generation, which matches what we're talking about for our generation now as meditation, that makes it easy, it gives them a tangible understanding. So great comments. Um, so we have another question. Uh, it is, what is your recommendation as a step-by-step -step progression for incorporating yoga, breathing, and meditation practice in a workplace setting as part of a wellness program? I think all of us have fabulous things to say about that. So who wants to go first? Anybody? I, I can maybe jump in a little bit. Um, I think it depends on where you work, number one, the industry that you're in. Um, one of the things that, you know, when, when I establish some corporate wellness programs is typically you work with the HR director and, and typically they're the person management, higher management that will um, hopefully want to create that culture of wellness. Um, so if you're looking at it more of an organizational standpoint, um, I would petition to them first, you know, um, if they don't already have something like that in place, because it really does, in my opinion, it's, again, if, if you're looking at for something at, at an organize, uh, organizational mm -hmm. level, is that your higher ups, it, or if you're in that position, that's fantastic, um, that they really encourage that type of uh, culture and environment. Um, I know it's kind of, you know, one of the things I found is that sometimes it's kind of trendy, you know, so to speak, to offer this and, um, HR and the executives, they want to, to portray that they're in that, that they do care. And so really getting them to understand how it actually benefits, not just the employees, but ultimately them and their bottom line, I found was actually very helpful because then you really get them on board. And then they then now allow time for that wellness, if whether it's like offering more breaks for it, um, bringing teachers in for meditation or yoga, um, creating the space for it because it can take real estate to do that right within the office space. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're in that position to champion for it, um, obviously you'll benefit it. And, and yeah. the people you're working with, if your boss is calmer, you're, you're probably going to be happier at work too. So that's, one yeah, that's a great, great point, May. And I, and, and I also think um, this is why I do think like the mindfulness meditation uh, series that we have at SC, that is something that could be very easily implemented in a workplace setting because you start with the education of what it is. It could be given at a lunch hour. It could be done through Zoom. It doesn't have to be done in person. And the, and then um, you know it's it. I I think it's pretty simple and very step by step. I went to I took one of Jim's series of classes, and it's beautifully done and it's very 
tangible and workable and very you know, easy to implement. And that might be a first start is like, okay, let's just have an educational program. And then from there, you can develop your own practice at work as a first step, perhaps. And I think that's a good point that you were saying um, is to keep it simple. Um, content wise, whatever you decide to do, um, if there's something that you really um, had a deep profound experience with then maybe use that um to share with somebody um but long deep breathing you know I think we've all mentioned breath work mm -hmm. but breathing consciously is something that can be very you know easily implemented or just doing some gentle movement in a chair consciously mindfully you know just little head movements that you're syncing with the breath that you're silently repeating a personal mantra to. So you're focusing the mind and then you can just drip little bits mm -hmm. in. Um, if it's at your personal workplace um, and you're going into the office, maybe you can play some gentle mantra music and you're just dripping little bits in. And then again, lead by example. So, um, they'll, they'll, they'll start asking, Oh, what are you doing? You know, you seem very calm in this stressful situation. What are you doing? And then you can um, just share your techniques with people. So that's something I would uh, say Thank to you, do. Gabrielle, uh, Sarah, and then we'll have another question. Great. I just actually sort of, sort of to what, what Gabrielle was saying, sort of the same just want to build out that same idea. The way uh, I like to frame it is that if when we go into the workplace, we are getting stress thrown at us all day long from different sides, and it starts to layer on top of us on almost like an onion. And if we wait till the end of the day to try to get all of it off, it's such a heavy lift. Uh, but if we can maybe set reminders on our phone, if we can teach the people in a workplace, give them a couple of tools, give them a few breathing techniques, a few stretches, a few, you know, how to do a jaw massage or for eye strain or for, for whatever it is, you sort of teach them these tools, but then encourage them 15 seconds, you know, like every hour, just do one thing and take off that last beating. And then, okay, this email somebody just sent to you, take that off to not not try to remove all the stress, you know, at right. once at the end of the day. Excellent. Oh. I, I just add one thing, Mar Marisa. Uh, <laughs> I think one of the dangers with workplace uh, 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 efforts in this regard is, is the danger of it becoming yet another stressor. <laughs> uh, like at, at the medical school here at USC, we've had to deal with that. It's really been actually kind of difficult. We, we're trying to inject uh, self-care and wellness into the end of the curriculum for medical students without burdening them with one more thing mm -hmm. that they got to do, right? right? So that's the challenge. Um, and I think that's where, you know, what's been said here is great. It's like if we can give people tools <clears throat> without uh, overwhelming them with courses that are expected to be taken, that's, that's going to help a lot. Great. I love this conversation. So our next question is, what advice do you have for a beginner yogi who wants to combine psychology, mental health advocacy and meditation and eventually turn it into a career? <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to, to start off this conversation. Um, I'll be honest with you, I walked the streets, I knocked on doors at the very beginning of my career, I did everything that I could do um, to, to see what worked also, like I was throwing everything at the wall and saw what stuck. Um, there's so many different ways to go about it. Um, me personally, I physically had to have a nine to five job whilst I worked at the side to build things up. Um, so, but I mean. Gabrielle, excuse me, but you got your master's equivalent of your master's degree in psychology, correct? Psychology in the UK, okay, correct. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Um, but 
I was a brand new yoga teacher to Los Angeles when I got my um, teaching certificate. And so it's, it's taken a lot of work, a lot of networking um, and just keeping every day I think about my mission. And so once you start anchoring down into your raison d'etre, which is obviously this, then it will become a little bit easier to put the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together. Um, but I mean, I literally, I was doing things like I was Googling sober living homes and making a list of every single one and cold calling all of them to, you know, to see if there was any opportunities. So it did, it did take some time, but be creative and um, don't give up because mm -hmm. if it's something that you're really wanting to do and to be passionate that you're passionate mm -hmm. about it is the best thing in the world so keep going if i can just give some examples i have some friends um who be were who are in a yoga a yoga instructor but they either have a degree in psychology and they work in the school systems and now they worked on with a neuropsychologist and they were doing testing. Long story short, besides doing testing, they now started able to offer uh, a yoga program um, for children in, in high school um, as a way of dealing with stress and, and emotional or some mental health issues. So um, I don't know if that's helpful or not, but that's just one example from um, somebody, another yoga instructor who had a degree in psychology um, started working with at different um, addic addiction and rehabilitation centers and started teaching yoga class to help uh, people overcome their addictions as part of the overall therapeutic intervention. Um, and I think it, you know, I think even hospitals eventually, you know, our school systems are moving in that direction. We have a lot of kundalini yoga programs across the United States in uh, public schools as part of, a, you know, a, a mental health program as well as a physical health program. That's just from what I know. I think it's about being creative with um, where you want to approach, who you want to approach, um, and just, just network. I mean, I was very in with my yoga studio. I was doing um, volunteer work there. And then because of that, I was able to get um, opportunities to do workshops on mental health. And then that triggered something else with another mental health facility. So it all, it, it will all fit into place. And we have one last question here. It says, these sound like wonderful programs do patients have access to these? Is it fee-based? Are there programs available for county and DHS patients? And I'm, I, I, I'll give you an example of what was available at county that I know of. Um, there is there was a uh, there is a pediatric endocrinologist, a, a, a physician who deals with diabetes, and he developed what what he calls this Imagine Health program, and it was an integrative health program that included uh, a four it was like a four week program. So we did a yoga set once a week for four weeks. They met with the nutritionist once a week for four weeks. They got the education the diet, the healthy cooking, along with the yoga for exercise and stress management. Um, and that was all free as part of uh, this uh, program at, at County to hopefully make an impact on childhood diabe diabetes. Um, I know that before COVID, County had many free yoga classes um, at the wellness center. Uh, all many, I think four days a week and even on Saturdays. And they had not just yoga class, yoga with meditation classes, but they had Zumba classes, they had Tai Chi, they had uh, many different types of, of mind body classes that were available for free. But because of COVID, they had to shut down. But when we come back um, to whatever our new normal is, um, I'm assuming that. Uh, 
those programs will be reinstated. Um, I don't know if Jim or Sarah know of any other programs or. I'm not smart about county uh, at all. Okay. The wellness Center, I heard of that, but right. yeah, our pro Yoga USC and uh, uh, Mindful USC are for students and staff only for free. So. Right. There was a big push though at county hospital. So I, in, I expect that to um, come back and I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank that it was healthcare partners or I can't remember what the other organization that was affiliated with the wellness center at county that also ran classes. Um, so I think that's gonna be your, the best bet um, for uh, individuals who uh, get their medical uh, care from county is uh, through that wellness center. Okay, I'm going to ask Emily, uh, are, are there, is there any other last questions? It's a little bit after four, or if any of our panels, is there any final words you'd like to say? Uh, there was one more question, or one more comment. So Margaret actually said, just FYI for everybody, um, Rancho has transitioned to have some programs on Zoom. So that's great. Oh, excellent, Margaret. excellent. Did not know that, good. Well, I want to thank our panel and thank our participants. I'm very excited to be surrounded by such wonderful role models for <laughs> meditation and yoga. And I'm excited that so much of our community and our fellow um, faculty and staff at USC showed up today um, and grateful to our keynote speakers and all of our uh, programs that we've had this afternoon.